welcome Anoop. Hi, Anoop. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hello, everyone. Hey, Anoop. Hello. Hello. Well, welcome to DevRev, uh, Anoop. You're meeting here a very global team. The team is joining us from India, across US, across Slovenia, and Germany. So. Uh, we're really excited about the topic today and uh, just to introduce Anoop to the team here. Anoop is the, the VP of product management at GitLab. Uh, he's passionate about the intersection of technology, entrepreneurship, venture capital and finance. Um, so first Anoop, congratulations on the recent IPO. Uh, it's been great to witness the growth of GitLab from the outside uh, with the revenue run rate of over 230 million dollars plus is and double digit growth as well 69 percent year over year growth so really uh, congratulations on the growth i know the team itself has grown a lot with 1300 employees but across 65 countries and that's really amazing and um and also tied to the topic today which is about uh, gitlab being fully remote uh being so globally distributed but making it happen by being fully remote at the same time uh since inception and then also being uh you know, radically transparent, uh, you know, in terms of, of the handbook and culture and the practices and how everything is transparent uh, and, and also an ability for others to contribute uh, to those practices. So I think that's that's really great. We're really excited to hear about the topic. So that's what Anoop will talk to us today about the, the origin and the story of GitLab. And he'll talk to us about the early experiments uh, with monetization models. Uh, he'll talk about the trials and tribulations and freedom of running uh, really transparent organizations. And uh, he'll also wrap up with the promise uh, about empowering developers, uh, you, know, you know, what that brings to the world. And I think we have a shared purpose there with DevRev and empowering developers. So uh, it's a great topic. We can take the conversation um, in a lot of different ways. Anoop has a, a document he wants to share, but I'll also uh, post it here and welcome everybody to submit their questions um, and comments over there as well. Welcome, Anoop. Over to you. Thank you, Bauna. Thank you, Deeraj, for inviting me. I'm super excited about what DevRev is doing. I've been watching the mission from outside. Um, I appreciate you all taking the time to listen to me. Uh, I'll start with one quick story and then we'll go into Git, GitLab in general. I was a developer for several years. My license has expired. I will not tell you that I code, but I do. Uh, but that apart, one of the things that motivated me early on to move into product was the lack of context as a developer that I was missing and decisions that were made where I felt like I could add value. And the only structure 10, 15 years ago was either you rise up through the dev ranks to become a very senior leader or you shift to product management. But we are in a wonderful, wonderful time right now where developers can be so much more empowered and directly connected. So I'm super excited about where the world is going. Um, with that, let me just share, I'll talk about five to seven minutes and hopefully we can go into Q&A. And I've added several links in the document so instead of PowerPoint slides, most of, because GitLab is transparent, most of this information is out there. So I've just curated it for you. You can dive deeper if you want. Does that make sense? Sounds great. Awesome. So GitLab's founding story was pretty interesting and goes back to empowering developers, right? So the developers knew they were writing code. They knew they needed to do continuous integration. And DZ, one of the founders of GitLab said, I need to connect this. I don't need to do this again and again, every time. And the common wisdom there was, no, these are separate areas, separate jobs to be done, if you will. If you connect them, you're uh, coupling them, but people might want more choices. Uh, regardless, DZ went ahead with it because it helped him. And he open sourced it. And soon enough, there was a community that started to form around it because others found this interesting, compelling, and useful. And then Sid found it, who's our other co-founder, and he essentially loved it so much that he thought this needs to be a company. So he sends an email to DZ and says, I love what you're doing. I love this space. I want to form a company around it. Do you have any problems with it? 
And in classic open source style, DZ said, well, this is exactly what open source is. You do what you want with it, as long as you're following the stewardship principles for it. So yeah, go ahead. If you want to make a company around it, that's great. Uh, more people will use the code I've written and that'll be, and more people will contribute to it. And that started the journey. Now, a year after that founding, DZ said he wants to work on it full time and he joined SID. And so they became uh, co-founders and the rest is history. So very interesting sort of origin story where it didn't start from an MBA business type trying to figure out what, what the world needs, but from real developers experiencing a real pain point and driving the value from there. Uh, because the original thesis was so grounded in empowering developers, one of the things the team did early on is what we now internally call the dual flywheel strategy. But essentially, the idea was it's built for developers, by developers, but also with developers. So there is no inside developer and outside developer. The idea is all the development is taking place in the open and others can contribute. What does that mean in reality? Well, in reality, the rubber hits the road when a developer externally writes code that a GitLab Inc. has to absorb and then support it with SLOs for enterprise customers. That's a very hard thing to do uh, because it's not written by the GitLab developers. So we had to put in a lot of systems in place to encourage this, create contribution architectures. And right now we get about somewhere between 100 to 200 contributions every month from developers uh, outside GitLab Inc which we call the broader developer community. And beyond sort of the, hey, you got a few features, the real amazing thing about it is these insights. So as a product person, no matter how hard I'll try, I will not, that, I'll not get that deep of an insight that a developer that's experiencing a pain point and has such a high intensity that says, I'm just going to contribute this because this is super important for GitLab to work. And then takes several weeks to months to write up uh, the code and contribute it to GitLab. And some examples of that, there are lots of examples of that, but one of the stages we talk about internally at GitLab is called the package stage, sort of the artifactory. And you'll notice over the last year and a half, a few developers have added substantial improvements to it. They are adding all the packages they need based on what they require. And what we built is a contribution architecture so that they can do it in a method that is resilient and can be supported by GitLab Inc. So that to me is the dual flywheel strategy, if you will. Uh, takes a lot of purpose and intention. And one of the rules we have is PMs cannot say no to contributions. So this is very interesting because, uh, hey, it doesn't fit my strategy of the vision of where I wanna take the product. Well, that's okay. It's open source. Let's figure out a method for them to introduce this capability in uh, as long as it passes uh, classic code review guidance and contribution architecture guidance and things like that. The next step is then, okay, we have this thing going, people are using it. Uh, but after all, it is an incorporated business company. How do we make it sustainable? How do we make sure that our vision that everybody can contribute has enough fuel so that we can actually make it real? So how do you monetize it? And there we tried several things. The first model, which I like to call the Wikipedia and PR model, which is like, hey, please give us money. Uh, we are doing this for a good cause you're using it, you're benefiting from it. And the interesting thing was that as the team tried to do it, it ended up becoming ice cream money is what we internally call it. What does that mean? Well, you get contributions from some passionate uh, people, but it just it's just enough for you to take your spouse for an ice cream every week, right? It's not really gonna help you build what you wanna do or at least that was our experience uh, several years ago. Then we said, okay, let customers pay for the features they want. Uh, and what 
And so that, that worked for a little bit, but what ended up happening is that multiple customers would see that they want the same feature. So either they would wait for somebody else to pay or they would say, hey, why should I pay the whole money can be divided? So it just as a sustainable business system, it didn't work. And you'll notice there are some first principle vibes here because Sid and DZ sort of approach these things with first principles instead of taking the common wisdom, hey, just build a product, right? And charge for the product. They truly wanted to rediscover these problems and see how they can look at it differently. Uh, the third thing was, okay, let's just ask for support uh, services. And then there again, um, what would happen is people would ask for capabilities which would uh, not necessarily be features, but improvements that would make support easier. And as soon as you, the team would do those, many of the support people, uh, people who had support subscriptions would drop off or they wouldn't need it anymore. So it was a perverse incentive that the better you make the product, the less support it needs. So every time you make the product better, you're actually not building a sustainable system. And so finally, where we landed up is on a, on, a, on a model where we have paid tiers and we thought about it, experimented a lot, but the paid tier model is based on buyer-based persona. And it holds true to GitLab's founding, which is anything an individual developer needs to do to get their job done is free. It's going to be in the free tier. It will stay in the free tier. Uh, and so there are really compelling capabilities in the product that one would argue developers would be willing to pay for as well. But from a stewardship principle promise for open source, the team has kept them in free tier. Anything that a team or a set of developers need together to coordinate and collaborate together, that starts getting into a, a paid tier, which we call the premium tier. And then the third one is anything an organization-wide uh, system needs. So organization-wide policies, security policies, compliance policies, uh, very sophisticated authentication and access control methods and things like that, that goes into the paid tier. So that's been the model so far. It's worked well, as Bhavna indicated, on the revenue side and uh, growth side, it's worked well. Um, and we continue to explore how to keep the stewardship promise and evolve our pricing. And then the fourth thing I'll talk about is the, the values. And so GitLab values, we call them the credit values. Um, and the philosophy is to lead by values. So if any of you watch Simon Sinek or follow him, he has a really nice YouTube video about the, what is the difference in leading by values versus leading by other methods? And the TLDR is that when you lead by values, you make yourself predictable to your users, to your customers, to your shareholders, to your employees or partners. And that builds trust and partnerships other, rather than being opportunistic and looking at every individual opportunity um, and evaluating it just purely on its ROI. Because then what happens is there is no consistent theme or method about how a company or an organization makes decisions and it feels very self-centered. Anytime GitLab is faced with a particular opportunity, they will look at what's the, what's the best benefit for myself. So as a partner, then I don't really know where you fall with respect to certain things. So leading by values helps a lot. And the values we talk about are collaboration, Results, efficiency, diversity, inclusion, belonging, iteration, and transparency. So that's how the credit is. But I'm going to talk about it in a different scheme because I think this is a self-reinforcing loop for all the behaviors we want in the company. It starts with transparency. So to the extent possible, we are extremely transparent. I'll give you a couple of examples. If there is an incident on gitlab.com SaaS, that incident and all the trials and tribulations and everybody's contribution are open and everybody can follow it. So if you are impacted, you can see exactly what the team's doing. Oftentimes customers will come in and give us other ideas about what might be going wrong to improve the system. A few years ago, 
many, many years ago, uh, GitLab wiped out its entire .com database. And it was a really hard time in the company's history. And the company chose transparency and live streamed the entire event, the site incident, and how the team members work together to recover from that incident. And that was pretty, pretty formative for the company's fabric around uh, having low level of shame, uh, owning up to your failures, but doing it transparently. What that spurs is a lot of inputs. People give you lots of information about what they want, why they want it. And that input helps you collaborate with them deeply. You no longer need this, what I call a lossy chain. You know, somebody in the field talks to a prospect, they find a signal that then they have to get to their solution architect that then writes that down and tries to chase a product manager. The product manager says, I want to talk to the person again. Well, it's a prospect. I can't get to that person. But then you sort of wait for multiple of these signals to come in. Then it gets translated to engineers, right? The classic old style cycle. Uh, you kind of bust through that lossy signal because you get direct inputs. You have to create a system for it so it's not no noisy, but it offers uh, amazing opportunities to collaborate directly with users. And it also, uh, from my perspective, goes back to diversity, inclusion, and belonging. You want us future users, not just the ones you are your safe. Because if you plan, we want everyone to contribute. And then once, well, how do you act? And this is where we talk about iteration and, and it's probably the hardest value at GitLab, iteration, because it's often misunderstood. It's not an excuse to do uh, poor work but it's a, it's a very intentional exercise to figure out what is the minimal viable change I can introduce in the system that validates the direction and gives value to my users. And then you iterate from it. A few years ago, when GitLab wasn't embracing design as deeply as we do now, uh, there was a request to see all the environment variables in a certain CI environment. And so there was a thinking about like, what should we do? Should it be a table? Too many environments eligible? Should there be pagination? What is the experience looking like? Should we categorize environments? And all of these are legitimate and we need to do it. But the way the team iterated is the first thing was simply literally dumping the, all the environment variables in a long form text into the page. Now that looks ugly, but it solved the problem for the developers that were looking for it. And then we got lots of inputs on how to improve it. And so we knew this is something users care about and they have different opinions. And so instead of guessing, we were able to guide it into the right design. And then finally, all of this leads to the last value, the results value, which from a GitLab perspective is very important and it's something that brings everything together. We also have hierarchies of these values because oftentimes a lot of team members will, we will have values, but there are, there are genuine conflicts between these values. Uh, they are not mutually exclusive and cumulatively exhaustive. Sometimes you have to make a trade-off. So if we have, tried as hard as we can to give uh, guidance on how to make those trade-offs. So for example, if there is a something you can do quickly, but then it won't be transparent because if you have to be transparent, you have to go through uh, some additional steps. Well, if it's more or less the same value, choose transparency first. It's okay to be slightly inefficient in service of transparency. So those sorts of trade-offs have been uh, to the extent uh, laid out clearly. 
So anyway, that's that's where I want to pause. There are a lot of things I've added into the doc around how we run product as a product person, and I can answer those questions too. But I wanted to open it up for Q and A. Thank you, Anup, and uh, really appreciate you doing this. Uh, takes me back uh, twenty four years, you know, back to UT Austin days, you know. Uh, and it looks like we've come a full circle from there and working on very similar things. Uh, maybe first question to start out with is, um, how do you folks grapple with transparency and compliance uh, on regulation being a public company? So what were the principles that you used to really order one versus the other? Yeah. That, that's a that's a great question. So the first thing was, uh, we used to say transparency always, and we had to change it to intentional transparency. So what does that mean? So we had to define that, and we spent a lot of time communicating that to the team. Why are we doing this? What is the implication? For example, our data numbers and our monthly active usage not just for the team as for GitLab as a whole, but individual stages and groups in product, we measure monthly active usage. These were all public. And uh, our ambitions around where we want to go for these were public, right? So internally product manager will say, I want to grow this 10% month over month. Well, that ambition was public. The target was public. And we had to explain to the team around the compliance requirements of being a public company, the fact that these things can be misconstrued by investors or eager hedge fund or short manipulators, and that can lead to lawsuits and other uh, problems for the company. And then when we did that, it was pretty clear uh, framework we had to establish, which we internally call the safe framework. And then that's what we use. And we, we moved a, a reasonable number of pages out of public handbook into an internal handbook because of that. But again, what we try to do here is we have a very strong single source of truth philosophy around your company's operating system. Because if you want to, if you want to move your company fast and make changes and that operating system has duplication, it becomes really hard for teams to align on the same uh, pattern. So what we do is if something can be in external handbook, it will be, and then the internal handbook will point to it, not the other way around. That way the, the, the gravity is still on the external handbook. Beautiful. Maybe switching gears a little bit. Um, tell us more about the on-prem versus the SaaS journey and uh, how do you folks uh, really, you know, release code and uh, do CI, CD, when you know that your customers might or might not, especially the on-prem customers, might or might not be willing to upgrade right away? Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, the GitLab start, wanted to start as the SaaS company first, but there was a huge pushback at that time around code being intellectual property and people being uncomfortable having it on SaaS. Uh, of course, we've come a long way now. So we ended up going self-managed first and then SaaS. And the, the challenges with self-managed, I think many of you are already aware of it. There are several inefficiencies with it. But we did a couple of things. First is GitLab releases every month on the 22nd and has done for the last 117 or so releases. So there is this clockwork cadence around uh, how we release. Uh, what does that do? Well, if, if a feature doesn't make it, people know it can come in the next release. So it, there is a lot more grace that the customers give when you have such a fast cadence on self-managed. The second thing we did is because it's every month, regardless of how fast we move, the Delta is not as big as the classic self-managed every three month, every six month cycle. So that was the surprise for me because that enabled some of, even our self-managed customers to be open 
with the possibility of upgrading often. The third thing we did is there's a maniacal focus on making sure that the upgrades are as easy and as eventless as possible. So what that did is it makes the operator be more confident that they can upgrade the releases. So we track this metric and what we found is, you know, within about 40% of the customers are on the last three releases. So that's, that's not a great number, but it's much better than the numbers I've seen in classic self-managed companies. And we continue to aspire to do better and better there. Our support policies also assist with this. So if you're a paid customer, um, then you know you get three months of support on the release, and then you have to move to the next release. So people have trained themselves, paid customers to upgrade. We see a lot more lag on the free users because a free user may install their self-managed instance and not upgrade it for a long time, but most paid users do. And again, in the interest of transparency, you can look this up, but there was an exploit on some 12 month old release or 14 month old release that we have fixed, but that exploit was uh, uh, had a huge potential to abuse. Uh, and there was an article written about it and things like that. GitLab fixed it, people who are upgraded don't have the issue, but that continues to be a challenge and we continue to look for ways to improve that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how does the support function differ between the self-managed customers and the SaaS customers? Yeah, that's a great question too. So uh, self-managed is classic more or less. For SaaS, what we have done is our, our ops team also takes a lot of ownership of support there. So we know and we have created systems to figure out is it a system-wide issue or is it a classic product feature support gap? And so once that triage is done, the workflow is routed appropriately. So if it's if it's a feature issue, then it's self-managed or SaaS, it doesn't really matter. It goes through the same funnel. And if it's a non-feature issue, then it goes to our ops team and they handle it. Got it, got it. And and we have uh, a single code base, so that makes it easier. Self-managed and SaaS were not split, which creates very interesting challenges because we want to have a uh, footprint that you can install GitLab in Arduino, but also a footprint where the SaaS system can run millions of users. Got it. Now we have a ton of developers in this audience, so maybe a little bit on your SaaS architecture, like, you know, what does the evolution, what did the evolution look like and where do you folks want to go from here in the next 18 months? Yeah. So it's a great problem to have is what, we talk about internally. When you have a SaaS that scales and you started from self-managed routes, the reason it's great is because people like your product. The reason it's a problem is because it's a hard problem to solve, like changing the, you can use the analogy you want, but right, like changing the engine while the car is running or whatever you want to call it. But uh, we've spent a lot of time in the last six months on looking at how we use uh, databases and how we need to do better there. And we call it a reliability focus. And the first thing was just take classic iteration values of GitLab, just take every single uh, choke point and try to improve it by following best practices. So even simple things that uh, uh, an experienced database developer will know, but a new may not is you know, people will do things like N plus one queries. And when you do that, you just load up the database. So we found lots of those things because we were iterating really fast. And we, so we had to go clean up all of those things. And so we went through a very systematic cleanup for the last several months. Then the second step we found is we needed to decompose our database. We were relying very heavily on certain really large tables so that's the step uh, that's ongoing right now. And then the question was, uh, what next? And how do we shard the system? And how do we, um, or is there other alternative architectures? So there is a sharding architecture and a pod architecture that are both being simultaneously done right now to make sure that the SaaS scales. 
So primarily our problems were on databases and how we were using relational databases, but because uh, the services architecture scaled fairly well, it was built with uh, the idea that you can scale up and scale down uh, with appropriate load balancing techniques and things like that. Got it. And speaking of the SaaS architecture, where does freemium come in the way of economics and uh, customer acquisition costs and cogs and things like that? And I mean, because, you know, GitHub probably had this problem as well, where they just weren't built for a long tail of freemium. Uh, yeah. And I wonder if you guys take any leaf out of their book and what learnings do you have with freemium and, and uh, SaaS economics? Yeah, that's a great that's actually another great question and something we talk about constantly. Um, so the interesting thing with GitLab was when we came back to SaaS, uh, because we started with SaaS, didn't work, went to self-managed, went back to SaaS. The idea was, hey, let's do SaaS so that people can test our product easily. We don't expect them to actually buy on SaaS. So it was put together with that sort of philosophy. And so it had a lot of inefficiencies. So for example, it had things like, um, you know, although after one year of inactivity, GitLab has the right to delete your repo, you know, it would just stay there. Uh, we would offer 10,000 CI minutes free for every user, at least two years ago, which, um, which is a substantial amount. If you think about a free user taking all 10,000 uh, minutes, um, per month. We had um, other things in the product which would allow you to exceed those 10,000 minutes because some, as you know, when you're running a CI pipeline, you're simultaneously firing many, many jobs. And uh, so the team hadn't put constraints, uh, measurement constraints. So somebody could fire off 5,000 jobs of five minutes each. And before the system would come back and find out, oops, you've already exhausted 25,000 minutes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was open to abuse as well. Mm -hmm. um, we have subsequently made a lot of those changes. Uh, so yeah, free, free cost is a, always a top of mind for us. But what we have found is there are two things that work really well in our favor. First, if you, if you take care of all the things we have in our control, we can bring the cost down pretty substantially. So it doesn't have to be expensive. Two, we have found that whenever we found uh, free users that are sort of going over the thresholds and we have reached out to them, they've been very collaborative in reducing their own cost because they understand that this is a gift uh, and then they, they, want, they want to be very responsible with it. So having a community that that sort of believes in the values of the company helps you. So there are, and so we take a lot of pains to uh, make sure we don't use sort of inappropriate language inside because it's very easy to say, oh, that free user is abusing the platform or is mooching off and things like that. And we're very clear about, no, we build a platform that everybody can contribute. We left the day, doors and windows open either shut them down responsibly, transparently, or if you can do it because you're busy doing something else, reach out to them and share with them why it is. And most of them are actually very supportive in, in reducing their cost. Uh, so this is a, and it's gonna be a constant thing for anybody building SaaS today. Uh, I, if you look at Cloudflare is one company I look at with respect to sort of, uh, how they control their costs is a very interesting uh, thing to learn from. They have a they have a team dedicated to uh, dedicated to this. If you think about Cloudflare, they they are at the forefront of abuse, and so uh, making sure that cost is appropriately controlled is sort of uh, existential for them. So that's a great company to learn from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, you would like to know about more is users and product usage. So what does your architecture look like with respect to product analytics and user analytics? And 
how challenging is the data warehousing problem? Yeah. When I joined GitLab, we, we, one of the things I was surprised was that we had very little data informed decision making at GitLab. Now, in hindsight, it makes sense because there are so many signals coming in and there is a technical co-founder, product co-founder. So there was a strong sense of intuition of where the product needs to go and pretty strong uh, response from the community if we made uh, poor choices or uh, suboptimal choices. So that was our guiding spirit and it still continues to be. So we started our journey in earnest on data there. Uh, how does the architecture look like? It's actually pretty uh, rudimentary and, and I think can go much, uh, we have a lot of room to improve there, but I can share basics. Um, so we have uh, what we call a service ping system on self-managed, which collects information, pseudo anonymizes it, and then ships it. The system is used to be on by default, but now we are very clear about the choices around, or around it. And it's optional. So there is no mandatory need for you to do it with the exception of licensing. So there's a cloud licensing piece that, you know, just checks for entitlement and a few basic things. So that's on self-managed. Uh, then we also use Redis. So some of the counters are collected in Redis and some of the counters are collected uh, in the database. Everything gets merged into a service being payload and is shipped uh, to GitLab. On SaaS, because we own it, it's the same system, but it just brings all that information in. We also use Snowplow for a lot of event collection. All of this then comes into, uh, into GitLab, and then from there it gets ELT'd into a data warehouse. What we don't have today is what we traditionally call a, well, or not traditionally, nowadays we are calling a lake house, right? and ability to have um, this vast amount of data where you can ask futuristic questions. So most of it goes into structured uh, analysis in Snowflake. We Six months ago, we hired our first data scientists because we needed to build this system first. Otherwise the data scientists will have no data or poor data. And now we are starting to do more of uh, the deeper analysis, if you will. So that's where we are with our system at GitLab. Got it. Bhavna, over to you if you have any further questions. Yeah, there's a number of questions from the team here uh, in your document, uh, Anup. I can start with uh, Anindya's question around prioritization of features. If you can talk about how that happens for the paid version. And I think Art has a similar question, but like, how do you? trade off or balance like the new community implemented features and how at the same time you deal with features in the free product that kind of replace or cannibalize like the paid features. Yeah, that's a great question. So how does prioritization of feature happen for paid version? Some examples of rice. Uh, we don't prioritize based on paid or free. We prioritize uh, and that may, that may sound out. So let me explain what that means. So at GitLab, what we do is uh, each, so dev ops and sec are three sort of sections, organizational groups. And then within them, we have these um, stages, right? So create is your SCM stage, for example, um, and package is your artifactory and package stage and so on and so forth. So each stage has a mission and, a, and, a, and the theme they're servicing. So create stage is primarily servicing the developer community. So they are not being asked to build features for monetization. So they are just looking at signals from the developer community and whatever is the right thing to build for the developer community, they are prioritizing that. Now, as they build it, it might be that from a buyer-based steering model, it, it belongs in premium or it belongs in ultimate. And so then that's how it ends up going there. What I do is that I'll do a look back and, and the look back is just to make sure that things are going as planned and there are no uh, 
So I'm going to give you a sneak peek now, but this will be in our uh, release kickoff pretty much shortly. And I was preparing for it last night. So that's why you, you're going to see this. So here are all the improvements. We call them improvements because I, I tend to want to avoid the discussion between free and uh, uh, between a bug and a feature to the extent possible. Uh, so here, this shows all the stages. And for 2021, this year, what percentage of improvements came in each stage? This is just by stage. Now, this is by tier. So uh, you'll see 70% of the capabilities that were shipped is in free tier, 17 in premium, 13 in ultimate. And this is by stage by tier. So you will see things like protect is a fully monetized stage. It's in it from a buyer base persona, it goes into ultimate tier. So almost all, so all features are in ultimate. You'll see verify, 94% uh, of features are in pre. Uh, create, you'll see 90% of the features are in pre. So we look at it broadly there to see that the philosophy and the mission is being followed. But then the buyer base persona is the lens that is used to figure out what feature goes in which tier. Does that answer your question in India, the first part at least? Yep, it does. Uh, one quick follow-up question I had was in the RISE framework, I saw some numbers around the impact of each uh, uh, feature or improvement. Uh, are there some example of how do you calibrate the impact to a user? Or is there any like quantitative measurement which might tell you that, okay, this feature is high impact? Yeah. It's it's an estimate right now on a number of one to ten based on the product manager's judgment. Uh, it can be better. Uh, some of the things we do to sort of inform that estimate is we do job to be done studies and then we do UX scorecards. So for each job to be done, so what there'll be a there'll be a job to be done scorecard where the user will walk through the job and then we'll figure out sort of how much time or how many clicks, uh, how much pain was it for the person to get that job to be done? And then that can help us estimate sort of the time impact. And then that can estimate based on the sort of opportunity cost of that individual, you can sort of create a business impact, but it's, it's inconsistent and it's an area we are looking to improve. Thank you. I don't know if there's uh, more questions over there. I think Art had a similar on, on features. And Ashwini uh, is curious about maybe tiering. If you can talk a little bit about your, your tiering strategy yeah. and what goes well. Awesome. So Arturo, this is a really good question. How do you deal with features in pre-product? So this happens more often than you would like to believe where uh, there is a feature in the paid tier because it fits the buyer-based person tearing uh, strategy and a motivated free user will say, well, I can build it. And they build it and they submit it. And they say, I want to put this feature in, in your code. Uh, and they might implement it slightly differently too so that it can work for free users. So this is the one place where we have a pretty clear policy where if it doesn't fit our buyer-based persona tearing, we will either not accept the feature or we'll accept the feature in the paid tier but we are very transparent about it from the beginning. And so we've had, uh, once the community understands, and this is where leading by values is important because they know that it'll be a consistent behavior. It's not opportunistic. They, they, they sort of embrace it. So we have had customers and free users who have contributed paid features as well. And we are very upfront that the reverse of it, Arturo, which is like, Yes, thank you for contributing, but this will be a paid feature. And then as a as an escape wall, one of the things we do is anybody who contributes gets an ultimate license anyway. So that team is able to use the feature that they build. Makes sense, thanks. Ashwini, do you get the number of features you introduce per year? No, we don't get it, but we, we always look at it from, it's not about the number of features, it's about buyer based persona and tiering strategy. We segment customers based on user analytics to decide the tiers. Uh, that's a good question. We, we don't 
segmented based on user analytics we base segmented based on personas so the the thing that feeds into the buyer based steering model is who is going to get value from this capability if it's a developer in their day to day job of getting things done then it's a free tier if it's a team manager or a lead who's trying to orchestrate things around uh the team to make the team more efficient and reliable then it's a premium tier and if it's an organization wide or a director level or above persona that needs to make uh, decisions and use it then it becomes a uh, ultimate tier yeah. on the same thread of uh, analytics uh nim has a question on you know we are we are you effectively using usage event data to determine upsell opportunities Yeah so we have a growth team that's actually doing a lot of these experiments and as i shared earlier we we didn't have as much instrumentation in the code before so as we have added instrumentation we are starting to do event analysis we run various experiments to figure out uh, what are the key delightful moments that help people a from from free user to trial or from trial to conversion or even within once converted uh, adopting a stage more uh widely than before and things like that we absolutely do that chandra you had a question can you please discuss recent pricing tier changes which seemed quite significant i think you're talking about the changes where we uh removed the starter tier which was our lowest tier and uh yes it was a pretty significant change a lot of analysis went into it and um broadly speaking uh the change went as planned we knew that it's going to make some customers or users unhappy uh but we took a lot of care on taking the starter customers individually and trying to help always find the right tier so we pushed some of the starter features into free tier um we took some and then other starter features went into premium and we gave them a a a pretty reasonably attractive ramp to get on to the premium tier so they don't feel locked in so one of the things we wanted to avoid is oh now i'm stuck i have to upgrade today right so we were fairly liberal around that and said no you're not stuck you can stay on starter for a foreseeable future and then here are the options on on the table for you and one of the things to remember there is also that uh some of them chose to go self managed and some of them chose to come to saas and others did leave us and uh, that was a business decision that we we spent a lot of time and uh, wrestling through this is the same thread and we need talk a little you said dev and ops and security so this uh, secure like those three um Three categories. Is it eighty twenty? Is it seventy twenty ten? It's kind of the distribution of like usage and users. Oh, usage and users. So each stage has their own usage, and um, so think about the DevOps life cycle. Let me just pull up a chart that will help. So if you think about uh, the DevOps loop, if you will, from create, verify, package, release, configure, protect, monitor, and plan, and then manage and secure, if you will, uh, each stage has its own monthly active usage that we monitor. Now, GitLab's landing strategy was create plus SCM uh, plus sorry sorry uh, create plus CI, so which is create and verify, and so this is our. has been historically the gitlab's land motion for first several years so what you'll notice is that this is where we have massive sort of usage so nearly 100% of the usage uh, users use create uh, nearly like 80% or so use verify and then plan is a big big usage driver 
package is a massively fast growing usage driver release and configure which is continuous deployment if you will and uh, is also a pretty strong uh, usage driver the new ones are secure and protect and so there the usage is lower but growing fast however as you notice secure is on the ultimate tier right so the the paid usage percentage there is much higher than the free usage percentage but we did put all the scanners down in open source uh, and in free, so people who want to sort of roll their own scanners and feel like they can, they're happy with that. Um, like developers, again, if I want to run my, run, write my code and scan it for security um, vulnerabilities, I can do that. But if I want a vulnerability dashboard that shows me all the commits that are going in and what is my risk profile, well, that's in an ultimate team. And obviously you want like the entire breadth of offerings to be adopted. I and mean, do you think of it as hooks? Like you start with, with create and verify and then how do you give them a little bit of the next year so they can get hooked on and start adopting the next stage and then the next stage? Yeah, that's a great question. So all stages are available on all tiers. So that's another intentional decision we did, which is to make sure that, Pauna, to your point, you want people to experience the, the capabilities so that they, they can make a thoughtful decision whether they want to use it or not without having to call up and talk to salespeople and get a trial and all the friction, right? So all stages are available in all tiers. So we do make sure that there is some of that available in all tiers. There's a few more questions in the document. Yes. Uh, Michael has a question around what tools do you use at the intersection of PMs and developers and customer support and product to edge leads? Yeah, what tools do we use between the intersection of PM and developers and customer support and product engineering? Yeah, this is a great question. For us, the answer is GitLab because GitLab itself has uh, uh, incident management, service desk, uh, planning epics and issues for your user stories and whatever other agile or scrum or what other development methodology do you want to use? And then the issues as the developer checks in the code the merge request is created and tagged with the issue so we can see the whole pipeline going through it all the way to deployment. So from a so that is the primary tool, but there is a lot of stuff that's not in GitLab that we where we have to pick other tools. So for example, our customer success team uses a tool called Gainsight uh, to connect with customers. And so what we do is we take our insights and analytics and aggregate them and share them into Gainsight. So a TAM or technical account manager and customer support can see how a particular user, uh, uh, particular enterprise says adoption is going, for instance. Then on customer support, we do have Zendesk. So although we have service desk, you know, to run an enterprise company, the kind of capabilities that are needed are not quite there in service desk. So we do use Zendesk. Um, and so to the extent possible, we try to minimize multiple tools, but we do have some. Yeah, ninth question is very interesting. Do you have a POV on future of developers as it relates to convergence of organizational functions? Okay, this may be pseudo controversial, but I'll share this. You know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, um, there was this sense in the tech industry that developers are single dimensional individuals, right? They know how to code their techies, but they don't really understand how the world works. They don't understand how the business works. And so give them a spec and they'll write it. And then if they make a mistake, tell them like you didn't understand the business problem. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, intentionally to create uh, the contrast. And I've personally experienced that. But I think, uh, the world has changed and first of all it was a wrong assumption in the first place um, i think developers are creators of today's world developer tools have become so sophisticated that you don't really need to know all the kind of things that we most of us learn um, to write effective business code and they can connect they can be designers they can be testers they can be operators so this idea that developer is a monolith I think is, is just legacy. And so I think of developers as creators and builders of the new generation. And frankly, just like, the, and this analogy may be slightly poor, but 
when people came out in the industry, we all knew how to use Word and Excel and spreadsheet. We didn't think of that as, oh, you have to get training for this. But there was a class of team members that would actually get official training on how to use Excel and how to use Word and how to use PowerPoint. I think of development in the future like this. You know, it's just people come out and they know how to code. Everybody knows how to code. It's a literary skill. And so now it's a matter of empowering these individuals to achieve whatever their ambitions and goals in life are. So that's like the higher level piece. Now from a tactical piece, organizational functions of dev test of security, I think I think of these as archetypes. So everybody knows how to code, but you specialize, you specialize in security. Uh, you specialize in SRE type coding, you specialize in uh, sort of systems coding or your business level coding. You specialize in how to run tests and write code so that the test harnesses can inspect your code in new and novel ways than classic uh, ways tests used to be written, right? Um, through dynamic analysis, through, an, through various sort of graph analytics and things that you can put into the system to decide your code coverage and what whatnot. So that's how I think of the world where it's going to move. Uh, and most of the standard work that will just get automated. You don't need a, uh, if it's a simple thing. I had a, I have a friend who has a, uh, who has a t-shirt and it's still relevant. He says, go away or I'll replace you with a shell script, right? His idea was like, if you're not adding value, I'm just going to automate you. And then so that you can add value as a human and not as an automaton. That's well said, Anup. Uh, I have a couple of quick questions, more tactical though. Um, your usage of Slack with customers and uh, intercom and pager duty, like do these tools even um, have relevance within the operations of GitLab? Yeah, today they do. Um, and we have tried, we, we, we actually had a chat Slack uh, tool that we had acquired that we divested because we didn't succeed in uh, making it integrated well. Uh, so yeah, we do have Slack channels, sh shared Slack channels with uh, customers. And, but the good thing is, as soon as anything becomes serious, it becomes an issue in GitLab and then it goes through that workflow. We do have pager duty for incident management, mostly because the on-call schedule management features there are more sophisticated, used to be more sophisticated than what GitLab had, uh, but we are getting better at that as well. Uh, so yeah, there are those tools and GitLab that uh, internal teams use. Uh, our principle is to try and dog food to the extent possible. So if you need something as a developer, just build it and start using it. But there are times when the, the cost to the customer is higher uh, if you dog food. So then in those cases, we make a different decision. Mm -hmm. And obviously you must talk about Atlassian given that this is one hour discussion right now. Um, they have, more or less abandoned the old bit bucket and now are mostly using Git. Is that a true uh, perception of uh, Atlassian? Yeah, well, my perception of Atlassian is that they have a bunch of customers on Bitbucket who are, for lack of better word, unable to move out of it. And so that's a reasonably, uh, you know, good business for them to have and keep, but I don't see them investing in improving it. And so mm. their focus has moved to value stream. Mm. And they are moving lock, stock, and barrel to the cloud. They're like, look, the, the last on-prem license will be 2023. So what do you folks learn from them? What do they learn from you? And how do you look up to them? Uh, for? Yeah, I think one of the things that Atlassian does really well is connecting the dots for the business user and creating an, a very strong sort of... Uh, tie in with the business decision makers in organizations. And, and that's sort of where they're doubling down as well with their value stream uh, focus, where they are trying to integrate the entire DevOps value stream and bring up the analytics so that they can show from the idea to inception, what the results are and what, what is the value of the developers and the, everybody coming together and doing the work. The second thing is their aspiration to be a, a go beyond a couple of personas and sort of own the whole collaboration workspace. Um, so we, we definitely see that uh, as a as a positive on, on their part. 
GitLab's view is that uh, you have to provide choice. Um, and so it's it's okay to have these opinionated value streams. And I think there is there is space for it. But we feel like more and more you have to you have to appeal to the creators and the builders because those are the decision makers of the next generation. And frankly, that's where the rubber meets the road in terms of efficiencies and improvements and uh, value driving. Hmm. But unlike them, you're not coming up with a date that says after this, we're not supporting uh, self-managed. No, we think we're going to keep both self-managed and SaaS. And we, and I think part of it is the design choice, right? GitLab made a design choice that it's the same code base. So it's, it's not, uh, Atlassian made a fork, which, you know, uh, you know, can be considered controversial, but it's worked out for them from a business perspective. And so the cost for them of managing two systems for the same product was exorbitant. At least that's my opinion. And so they had to break away from it. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Anip. I want to be mindful of time, but uh, thank you so much for this time and for doing this in a true GitLab fashion, being very transparent. Uh, appreciated all the insights, including like sharing some of the numbers and charts and going deeper into your practices and, and how you think about tiering strategy, et cetera. So thank you so much for your time. Right, thank take you. care. And I'll answer some of the questions in the doc that were not unanswered. Catch Bye. up, yeah. Bye. Have a great. Take care. Bye, everyone.